Hi Claire, how are you? Good, how are you? So good to okay. see you. Yeah. Hi. I love, I love, is this a blazer? Is this a, a jacket? Uh, it's like a shirt with a like extra bit, so I just wear it loose. So. That's really cool. It looks like a jacket or like a trench coat. Yeah, yeah like more kind of like sculptural. If you don't mind, um, introduce yourself. Yeah, of course. Um, so my name is Claire Muller. I am a stylist and brand strategist based in Sydney, Australia. I also have a brand called Acid Flowers, which is fine art florals. And so I work with a whole lot of different brands and businesses to help them, I guess, tell their stories and get clear on who they are and what they're doing in different ways. So that is everything from top line brand strategy, um, defining and refining their market positioning and working out um, where they sort of need to play in the market right through to like copywriting and doing development of brand assets through to still life styling. So I use a lot of um, props and products and uh, like objects to do still life pieces for all sorts of different clients. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love specifically because you about how many different hats you're wearing that you are both analytical business oriented, but also creative, which is uh, quite a combination because I feel like normally people are more heavy than, than one than the other, but you have this really good balance of both worlds, which is quite unique to see. I have so many questions about just how you kind of do all of that uh, mm -hmm. as well as well as being so creative because you know I feel like oftentimes it's really overwhelming for creatives if you are doing start doing a lot of the business part of your um, you know or even like strategize uh, consulting with other I feel like it's quite a lot of a uh, um, brain power you have to have in order to manage all of that. Um, one, one question I have is, um, I love asset flower and how you manage to grow from the ground, just basically all by yourself. And you got so many good uh, public press and you, you got featured on like the fashion week and stuff like that. And you get a lot of cool people using your product. Um, so I was wondering when you first start, how did you get the word out and how did you like, what, how did that uh, fashion week opportunity knock on your door? Um, okay, and yeah, it's an sure. advice. That. Yeah, so I guess AF is quite an interesting case study because I obviously have had the benefit of being in the industry for a long many time. Years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, you know, I've worked on other people's product launches and I've, you know, I've done PR and social strategy and, you know, marketing strategy for a lot of other people. So it was a nice opportunity to sort of bring those skills together onto my own thing. So with Acid Flowers, it wasn't actually initially launched as a business. I guess it was just planned to be kind of a project mm -hmm. because it was fun and I liked making it and I thought it was beautiful. I was like, let's, we'll just see what happens. Um, I do tell people all the time, if someone came to me with the idea of Acid Flowers and was like, oh, hey, Claire, like I want to start this business. It's going to be flowers that you paint and then going to sell them to people. I'd be like, no, no, no. Like, terrible idea the logistics are horrible like it's a perishable good like, you have to hand paint each one like disaster yeah. like you never make it work yeah. here I am so <laughs> glad I persevered um but I guess getting getting the growth on AF was a combination of different things so all of it has been organic in the sense that it hasn't been paid for mm -hmm. with ads but mm. there's definitely been a lot of PR and influencer strategies so I'm fortunate that through my work like I know a number of people who are quite influential in different fields or different media mm. so I was very um I guess targeted early on with gifting so mm. I made sure that I got the products into people's hands who like A, I knew would love them, but also that mm. they had an audience and I thought that they would probably share them yeah. with that audience. So yeah, a, like influencer and PR strategy was very, um, 
very much part of the growth in the early stage. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't do that so much anymore just because it's I seem to get quite good organic growth at the moment. Mm -hmm. But certainly I think it's something that if you've got a physical product, I think that is a really important thing because as much as you can get like press and get things in magazines or, you know, get something online, like that's great. But at the end of the day, people want to see someone that they know and whose style they like kind of interacting with a product so they can understand how it fits into their own lifestyles. So yeah, for me, that was a, a huge thing. Um, Fashion Week came about because a stylist that I know very well called Monica Morales, who is an incredible fashion stylist. Um, we actually studied together when we were 17 back in Perth um, for a year. And then we went off and did our own things and have ended up both back in Sydney. And um, she was working with an Australian fashion designer called Mariam Sadiq, who is phenomenal, does these like beautiful, colorful, sculptural pieces, really amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, and Monica was styling the, the show for Mariam and she obviously knows my work because we're friends and she was like, I can see it. This is, this has to happen. Let's make it work. So we just got chatting and yeah, it just kind of evolved from being like, oh, maybe just like one or two flowers being held to just being like all over all the clothes, which was really fun. So yeah, yeah. Again, just kind of having a network over a long period of time and working with people that you you trust and respect creatively. Like I know so many people in different fields that, you know, maybe I don't, you know, see them every week or like talk to them all the time, but we follow each other's work and you know that they're the person who is the best at one thing. So when you need that mm. thing, you're going to that person. So yeah. So yeah. Keeping yeah. the network is really important when you're trying to build yeah get a product out there as well totally that's really good to hear that you know you're able to kind of leveraging all your years of experiences in the industry and it kind of become a little bit of like a stepping stone when when it comes to grow your a business um so that is really you know helpful to hear that you can always if you have experiences later on, it's going to pay off, even if you don't do exactly the same thing, like your asset flowers, not PR marketing and a strategy, but yeah. you're able to use that. Um, it's really cool. Um, I want to switch in gear a little bit, talking about your styling career. Uh, I know you're quite a stylist. I, by just watching like the work you posted and on set, the behind the scenes. And I know you through Helen Coker, who like referred me to you because she's just such a fan of yours for styling work. So how did you start uh, styling and what advice you have for people who are young, yeah, maybe just graduated from college, wanted to start a styling or eventually maybe graduated to like art directions. Cause I know a lot of people from jump from styling to art directions um, to be like a director level. Uh, how do you, how do you suggest people to start? Yeah, totally. Um, styling was an interesting thing for me. Like I, I studied fashion design, so I never, um, I guess officially studied styling and as much as there are courses out there where you can specifically learn that at a tertiary level I don't think it's necessary like most people I know who are great stylists have gotten there through other avenues so I think that's my first tip I'd say don't feel like you have to like get a degree in styling to be a stylist yeah. um yeah. I was always really interested in the sort of broader brand storytelling and I guess the the things beyond the clothes in fashion so I'm like obviously like I love clothes I love beautiful things but I was also like the sets you know the runways the like the photo shoots like everything else that went on top of that to go with um like enhancing this garment so I got into styling and visual merchandising quite soon after uni so that was just something that like I knew I was interested in that. So I just pushed to get into that space early on. And it was like, you know, merchandising in stores, like it was nothing wildly exciting. Like I was fortunate to be working with beautiful 
beautiful uh, labels, but mm. you know, it wasn't anything, it wasn't these like huge dramatic conceptual pieces. It was like, you know, make the store look beautiful, have a beautiful bunch of flowers, like make sure everything's spaced properly. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, it's like that is a really good basis for understanding what you need to do as a stylist because it is very much about like detail and creating something that is fit for purpose so mm -hmm. um, with most commercial shoots at the end of the day you are trying to show off a product in its best light or you know create a mood around a product so that you know it can sell because that's what you're doing the shoot for right so I think that's something that I only realized a bit later in my career I think early on I was like it's all about the concept it's about the colors it's about like it's got to be like super creative and amazing like you can never do anything that looks even remotely similar to anything that's existed before and I used to get a bit frustrated with like clients or art directors who are like we just want you know this thing where the product looks great yeah. like don't cover it up with too much stuff like we want to actually see the product and I was yeah. like it's not creative enough this is terrible <laughs> and I realized now that <laughs> There is a, you know, a time and a place for everything. So um, making sure that your concept fits the brief is really important mm. in commercial yeah. work. Um, and that doesn't mean that you can't be creative with it, but yeah, finding that sort of balance between creativity and commerciality in mm -hmm. the sense of creating the right formats and making sure you can actually see what you're trying to show off and that mm -hmm. you're not hiding the hero product with yeah. a million other brands that shouldn't actually be there. Yeah. So I guess that's a, in a roundabout way, a tip. Don't like let your creativity take you away from the focus. Like let that, let that product be the thing that sparks your creativity. Right. Um, and then I guess like getting into styling for people who are interested and maybe don't have like commercial opportunities yet, if they don't have a lot of folio going on, just start styling like set yourself a brief and you know whether that's you know a product that you have yourself that you love or you know if you're styling in in fashion like just choose a theme or something that's interesting to you at the moment and build a story around that like you can shoot it yourself get one of your mates to shoot it like get your friends to model you know get yeah. like you know, beg borrow and steal space and stuff and equipment like you don't need a reason to do that like mm -hmm. creativity is a reason so yeah it's, it's like you don't need permission to create a shoot yeah. and that forms the basis of your folio that gives you the understanding of how to do things like yes you might not have all the lighting equipment like yes you might not have a massive studio but you can create something really amazing with limited resources and yeah every time you do that that teaches you new skills and new things and like what works and what doesn't and then that's how you like work out what your style is and then pop that all on insta and you've got a folio and yeah totally totally <laughs> yeah i absolutely agree with with you and i think to start with you can just start in your in your, in your living room um if you're not shooting like models and if it's like a smaller product enough you just need a table you need the backdrop you need a, a natural light window or you can get fancy get one lights um you really don't need a lot to mm. start creating your portfolio or you can find a you know a nice nice area outside uh, set up your little thing with really strong, bright, harsh lights. That's also really beautiful. And I love what you said that uh, you don't need a reason to start. You don't need a combination to start. You, you create, it's creativity. You can just create whenever you want. Uh, I love that you're giving like people the freedom to be able to do that. So sometimes people are like, why am I doing this? Like it's not paid, it's not for a brand, it's, there's no reason for it, but no, like the reason is for the creativity and then you're having fun while you're creating like, things. And I think so often the best work comes out of those personal projects. Like that's <laughs> where you get to explore ideas and like push yourself further to you know, evolve your style. So I work with a lot of different photographers and we just do test shoots for fun. We'll be like, oh, I want to try this, I want to try that. And it's something that you might not ever get 
the chance to do on a commercial shoot because it's not right for you know the client's product or you know it's too expensive or like whatever but you test that outside and then people see it and they're like oh that's cool like I want that so mm -hmm. totally, totally another, yeah totally another question is about do you um since you've been working as um stylist for many years now do you what is the best practice for prop stylist do you guys rent a lot of things do you guys purchase a lot of things or own it that make mm -hmm. sure the pieces is more evergreen you're just like able to repurpose that these pieces over and over again or do you like what are like some common practice or like maybe your best prop practice because I know some a lot of people have to purchase and return maybe that not considered a super ethical but sometimes we do have to do some of those um according to like the budget but what are like the best practice you think for a prop stylist I think it's a bit of a combination of those things so I reckon any prop stylist who is working regularly will have a set of props in their in their mm -hmm. library which are things that they know are useful to use all the time and like certainly the Moulier pieces fall into that category like they're just versatile and awesome and you can just use them in so many different ways so it's like something like that would be a staple that you'd probably want to own and like obviously mm -hmm. when people are starting out like you can't go and spend thousands of dollars in one hit on you know this library so you build it up over time and you'll just learn what kind of things you like using and what kind of shapes and what kind of scale works for you so I have you know a large collection of like white objects and plinths and mm. things but then also like a lot of things that are pink and then a lot of things that are stone because they're they're colors and surfaces that I use a lot mm. and I've just learned that over time um otherwise I do rent pieces on occasion depending on what it's for so mm -hmm. I think when it's for if it's for like food and beverage that's mm. pretty easy so you, there are usually quite extensive like rental libraries for like plates and cutlery and you know yeah. tableware which is amazing it gets a bit harder for sort of fashion-y objects because mm. if you're working commercially in fashion like say you're shooting a pair of like a, like a sunglasses brand like that's cool you're going to get all the sunglasses as the product so then you're propping it out with different bits and pieces but say you want to have like a bag in there and then you want to have some shoes and you have some jewelry you can't for a commercial shoot you can't usually go to another brand and be like oh hey I'm I'm shooting these sunglasses can I borrow your bags to put in the shoot yeah. because the sunglasses brand isn't selling the bags they're not going to prioritize those you know they're not going to get tagged in the pictures there's not really any benefit to the bag brand to yeah. for it so yeah. in that circumstance I usually try and get the client to um, understand that they need to have enough budget to pay mm. for whatever other bits and pieces they need to buy to include in that so mm. um, I'm not a fan of the buy and return I don't think it's something that should be happening I think clients need to understand that it costs money to produce shoots and you can't just magic stuff out of nowhere so for me that the buy and return puts a lot of pressure on you as a stylist because mm -hmm. you're outlaying money on something that the client hasn't budgeted for properly and then if mm -hmm. that gets damaged or you can't return it that's then on you so mm -hmm. it's something that I think is avoided if possible <laughs> yeah. um, but look we've all done it at some point in time sometimes you have to but yeah definitely yeah not the most ideal thing but yeah I think it's like it's having that combination of you build up a library over time of your own own props that you um use again and again because they're versatile and then you'll buy specific things for specific shoots and you know maybe some of those will end up in your library maybe some will go to the client maybe some you know you'll sell because they they were only useful for one thing and you don't have space to keep everything so yeah I think it's a bit of a combo
Yeah. Yeah, I love that answer. And I love that you support not returning. Um, just make sure you communicate with the client ahead of time. This is type of a shoot we're producing and how much budget we need for this kind of shoot. So um, yeah, because I don't think it's super ethical, but I also understand some, there are times there's just no other way to work around it. I prefer just not return the things but they are definitely I have definitely done like returning a couple of things because I just couldn't figure the other way out um so I love that you said try to like work it out of ahead of time if there's like absolutely no way and then I feel like if you have to return and return a couple of things but definitely try to not do that at first um yeah, so um, for styling, like I know um, you obviously, because I said flower and you probably have done a lot of spray painting ahead of, uh, before while you're styling um, other, you know, photo shoots. Um, and then you're so good at like painting things. I know we previously talked about it, like your tips on like painting things. Um, so I think the important things needs to be re repeat all the time. So I, I just wanna you to kind of explain or kind of, cause a lot of photographers actually don't know how to spray print. Print, believe it or not, that they when when we started sharing some of these, they were just like, "Oh wow, this is so useful." So I wonder, because you do a number of different type of uh, techniques, so you do spray paint, you do other painting uh, techniques. Um, so I wonder if you have any good uh, insights or tips to share. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think spray painting is the one that like we're all gonna use at some point as stylists because you always wanna make things different colors. Um, for me, it's very much about making sure that the surface is kind of primed and ready. So like, say you've got one of the Muglio primer pieces, perfect, amazing, it's already primed, that's good to go. But if you've got something that, you know, you've like found at a junk store and it's like, it's already a color or it's like, maybe it's made from plastic or something and you don't know how the paint's gonna react. Just make sure it's clean, like if there's no dust, like wash it off, let it completely dry and then get an appropriate primer. So you can get different primers for like, for metals and for plastics. Um, and that's really important because otherwise your paint is gonna go blotchy and not stick properly. So yeah, prime nicely, like that's important. Um, and then technique for spray painting and for primer, I'm a big fan of like the short bursts. So it isn't the like getting the spray can and like going like this, like not a vibe. You've got your object and then just short little bursts, like really gentle. You can just do like, you don't need too much pressure on the lid and it's just doing those like even little strokes. Don't try and get like, the whole surface in one go, like the paint will combine. Yeah. So just a really fine layer because otherwise it gets drippy and mm -hmm. that's no good. <laughs> I've definitely made that mistakes on set that and then it was just so rushed. I was, I have to pin this thing while they were shooting and it was not enough time and it was like, shh, and it was like a right, a plastic ball thing. And all the pen is draping down. It was a horrible. Um, so that that said, I feel like you should always spray paint everything before the shoot day. Um, <laughs> do not yeah. make the same mistake I did. Um, and also another thing, I wonder how how long do you leave the things dry until you like touch them or oh, you yeah. know that it's completely dry. That's a good question. It's actually really dependent on the weather and that can really, really change drying time. So like in Sydney over the last couple of weeks, we've had heaps of rain, like obviously to do with the flooding. Um, and it's just been like really humid, really wet. And I was painting some props for a shoot and they took like more than 24 hours to dry just on one side. And even then it wasn't properly dry, whereas normally it would take like a couple of hours. So I'd say if it's dry conditions, probably want to leave it for like an hour before you 
poke it, like just make sure mm. it is, you know, if it looks wet, it's still wet. Like, wet. It. <laughs> because you're gonna be like, oh, is it? Like, you're just gonna get a fingerprint in it and then that ruins your day. So yeah, I think at least an hour before you go anywhere near it, mm. if it's dry conditions, but if it's wet conditions, like leave it as long as possible. Cause yeah, paint yeah. does not like when it's wet. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I I don't poke this way. I try to use my back of my hand. Uh, I don't nice. know why. I don't know good. why. I f- yeah, I feel like this way is safer. I don't know. That's just how, how I do it. Um, but it's definitely um, a process when you pin stuff. And uh, it takes definitely takes time to do it. Um, I love that you, sh- you said different surfaces has different type of a prime primer. Um, do you use different type of paint for different surfaces as well when you paint them? Um, mostly not. So as long as I've used an appropriate primer, then okay. I usually use the same kind of paint when I'm painting. So I use um, Montana Colors 94, so MTN 94. It's really beautiful flat color. There's an amazing color range. And it just, it goes on really evenly and it dries really nicely. So that's my, my pick for. Go to. Yeah. Uh, go to. Yeah. I love Montana. Is that, do you use gold or do you use other? Cause I know they um, have. So I, I just use the 94. So the range, 94. um, yeah, 94 is like flat. It's a, like a matte color. Um, oh, okay. And it's just, for me, that is just the most even surface that I can get and it, it usually dries really nicely versus some of the other ones like like gold or, not, like, or hardcore sometimes are a bit blotchier and yeah. I know like that can be in the application so maybe it's my fault but no <laughs> 94 is where it's at Ooh, I love that I love that um do you what about the primer where do you go to get the primer for different surfaces surfaces um actually uh, Montana Colors makes amazing primer as well. So they do a great plastic primer, a great um, like all-purpose primer, which is called a wash primer. Okay. Um, and so I use that for like metals. And then if you are painting like wood or something, there's just like an all-purpose primer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that. And you know, like that's a really great t- tip. I like prime with different, um, different primer with different surfaces. I think maybe that's why some of my stuff doesn't stick really well because I didn't prior. It, like it makes so much difference. And I think it's one of those things you just don't think about until it hasn't worked. And then you're like, oh, I've ruined that thing. Like, Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, let's talk about uh, something on your course. I obviously watched your course and you talked a lot about like the business and the researching and like the unique selling point and product market fit Um, a lot of these really good knowledge when it comes to start your own business Um, so I was wondering for service provider service based mm, provider or business um, how how do what are like the good example of like the unique selling points say if you are a stylist or a photographer you're providing a services um it's I felt like it's a little bit harder compared to the product because you're providing a services obviously you're you you're unique mm-hmm. like the style and different but besides that I wonder if you have any good insights of how do service provider differentiate themselves with other service providers? Yeah, so I think that definitely does come down to style and what that person is offering in this circumstance. And I agree when you're providing a service that is you and your creativity, that's quite different to selling a product where you can be really clear about like, this is it, like, it looks like this, it's this high, like it's red versus you know, a person who is, you know, creative and flexible and can change what they're offering depending on what the need is. So I think for service providers, it is about being known for something. So mm-hmm. say you're a photographer 
that's great. But if you just type photographer into Google, you're going to get like a million options, right? Yeah. So it's about making sure that you are the go-to for one thing. So mm -hmm. I think whether that becomes, you know, moody portraits or like landscapes in remote locations or, you know, the person that you want to get your LinkedIn headshots by or, you know, a editorial fashion photographer who is really known for like whimsical style. Mm -hmm. I think it's just about working through your, like your folio and your style and pulling out those points that make you recognizable and making sure that mm. those are really part of how you're describing your work and how you're speaking about your work so that that becomes really cemented as your baseline. And it doesn't mean that you can't do other stuff. Like, of course you can go and shoot other styles and you can work on other projects, but if you position yourself as the go-to for one thing, then people will come to you for that. Totally. versus anyone else because you become the expert in that space totally. and so it's just about like yeah filtering down from being like okay cool photographer and then you're like okay portrait photographer and you're like how are my portraits unique what about my portraits is my style so that people can recognize that externally yeah I love that I love that I, I think it's about like a trimming down what you're providing and specialize on uh, like one thing or two things, not get super wide and doing everything on your portfolio or even on your Instagram because you're just going to kind of like distract people, click, click mm -hmm. out, uh, even if individually every single photo is stunning, but together somehow made your portfolio weak because people are just like confused. They don't know what's, yeah. what you're providing to them. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's really yeah. just that editing, right? So, and it, it's actually really hard. That's why putting folios together is like time consuming and it is challenging because you have to, um, you know, you have to cull some things and they might be things that you really like, but if they are so different to the rest of your body of work that they're gonna confuse people, then that's why you, you add another section somewhere that's just like personal work and then that becomes the random things but you keep your you know your main offering really easy to understand yeah yeah and I know that you are running the business but on side you're still um taking on the consulting work and the styling work is that correct yeah and what would you say like a week or in a month like what is your um time split it into how much time you are focusing on, on your business how much time you are doing like the project uh client work for a different project mm -hmm. or is there some point that you feel like oh maybe this month I have a lot of work I need to focus on the SF flower so I will stop booking like how do you balance everything yeah it's um it's kind of fluid at the moment so mm -hmm. last year I was on retainer with a few different startup clients. So I had, um, I guess, a lot more structured split. So I was like, okay, you know, I've got this day with this person, that day with that person, then I'm doing a shoot and then the rest of the time is acid flowers. But this mm -hmm. year, just full-time freelance and consulting. So it allows me that flexibility to um, like change how much client work I'm doing versus how much work I'm doing on the business. So um, I guess, most of the time I'm looking at like a half, half split mm. at the moment. But if I have a big project with AF, then it means I can just be like, cool, like these three weeks, I'm not taking any client work. And so I give myself more time, which is nice. Yeah. Oh, con congratulations, by the way, your recent launch for um, those beautiful flowers. I'm like, when I saw it, I'm like, this is so beautiful. It's really, really stunning. And uh, I think especially with larger scale, if you just have an empty wall and have one of your larger uh, print, would it be so cool? Um, and I love like the water texture, you mix it in, it looks really cool. Did you uh, collaborate with a photographer on that or were you able to yeah. just take? 
You did. No, I, I worked with um, Safak Babakani, who's a photographer that I work with all the time commercially. So we're really good mates. Um, and yeah, we I just trust him to understand what I'm going for. So we work really well in the studio together. So I love working with, I guess, people who are really specialized at what they do and bring their own kind of flavor to something. So Savak is an amazing product photographer, like definitely one of the best in Sydney, if not Australia, like oh, really wow. knows no his stuff. So good, so good. The texture, the color, everything's just, I feel like the photo was alive. That's the feeling I was getting. Oh, amazing, thank you. Yeah. Um, I've got some very fun stuff coming up later in the year that's sort of evolving on that style. So got to look yeah. out for that one. I actually have a question. This is a selfish question. Uh, I am this year considering like launching a different type of product that mm -hmm. involves me um, kind of prints out other other creators work and mm -hmm. selling as a physical product um okay. not exactly prints as, as you um but like somewhat like you have to print that thing and the selling as a good product um but I was wondering if you because I haven't really done things like that so I was wondering if you have any insights or um any suggestion I am obviously a tiny business at the moment um how does that work when you your product is involved with somebody else's artwork um do you just pay like do you suggest me pay like one time flat fee or do you suggest me to pay like a flat fee and on top of that kind of depends on how many product I sell I give them like a percentage what would it be or it kind of I assume it's in, 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 in realistically there are probably a lot of different variety that you can work it out um, but as a really small business I cannot pay like thousands of dollars up front so I wonder if you have any suggestions how do I navigate that um sorry I'm just coughing I've got COVID um no worries <laughs> um I think in in the circumstance where you're working with other creatives and you don't necessarily have like a huge budget up front, mm -hmm. I'd be looking at doing like a, a profit split. So, mm. oh, sorry, two seconds. I'm just going to go cough and I'll be straight Yes. Back. yes. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, back, hi. Hi. Sorry. No worries at all. We can edit that out even. Amazing. Um, yeah, so I think if you're working with other creatives on a project like that and you don't necessarily have a huge budget upfront, I'd be looking at doing a profit split. So mm -hmm. depending on obviously the work involved upfront in creating that, that image or that that print or whatever it is and then the work involved in what you're doing which is like getting it onto another product and doing the marketing and getting it out there you sort of work out what a fair balance mm -hmm. is on that um so once the pieces sell and you're splitting the takings on those mm -hmm. um, and then I guess the other way is to do like a fixed percentage so agreeing up front that the the creator will get you know, 10 or 20 percent of all sales and that's just a flat fee that you offer to everyone for that that service mm. or it's like working out a flat rate at the start and be like okay i will pay you x as the amount that will license this image mm. for its use and I think it, it just depends on kind of what you've got to play with and yeah. how much people, um, I guess, want to get involved. Because often mm -hmm. with things like this, it's like, it's an additional 
income stream and it's an additional way to get your work out there. It's not like this one thing is going to pay your entire salary for a year. It's just part of many things that you're doing. So I think people usually understand that, you know, you don't have millions of dollars up front to um, yeah. launch this business. Like. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's helpful. I think uh, you mentioned like a combination of uh, having like a flat fee up front and giving them percentage of uh, each piece of sell. Or you also mentioned, what was the other one you mentioned, like the profit split thing? Yeah, so I think the so profit split is if you like you're both going in at the start, you know, they've provided the, the image and you're providing the other stuff. And then when the pieces sell, you split the profit that has okay. come out of that. So, so there's no upfront fee involved. Yeah. So that would okay. just be you're sharing what has been made on those sales. Any technical uh like any advice that how would uh because I want to be like transparent with the creator who I'm collaborating with, right? Like how would they be able to actually see how many pieces I sold? I wonder if there's like any common practice in the industry for yeah, something. Yeah, I mean I think I guess that is just about having a good relationship and trusting what your um like the figures that you're providing to them. Um but Otherwise, I suppose they Any could tool do, that yeah. you can use to um, mon monitoring that. Well, it depends what platform you're using to sell the pieces. Like you could always give them, like if you were using Shopify, you could give them like yeah, read only yeah. access to the back end. But then I don't know if you can set that so that they only see like one mm -hmm. product. They probably have access to your whole store, which is yeah. not necessarily what one wants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is um, that is a good question. I would have a look on Product Hunt, which is like the the tech platform for like all good mm. digital products. Like anytime you need something, someone has made some kind of plugin or app or <laughs> product for help. So have a look on that. Yeah. Thank you so much. I love that you are, you know, like a random, really practical stuff like that. Like, I don't know, that's the place I could look into something like that. That's really helpful. Um, Secret tech nerd. <laughs> you are? I, Do you I, code? I can't code, um, but I understand enough about, I guess, digital products that I can, can have you conversations. You could be a product with. manager. Like you could have, well, like, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I've kind of ducked in and out of that role mm. with different startups that I've worked with. So, yeah, yeah. that's really cool. I, I, I had no work. idea you're <laughs> you're such a tech nerd. Um, yeah, that's really cool. Um, I feel like that's all the questions I have. I'm trying to think. There's probably like ten minutes left, and I'm trying to think if there's anything selfishly I just want to ask you <laughs> um uh actually maybe there's this something I'm also currently trying to figure it out I don't know if you are also looking forward to do this this year or next or ever um to finding like a good distributor seeing like other area or even other country um i have i just don't know how to doing that effectively i know you can always find their emails try to cold email them or try to dm them send them like a brochure or a catalog of things mm -hmm. um but i just feel like that's not the really most effective way to um, approach that so i wonder if you have any insights for that I, having worked sort of in and around the fashion industry for a really long time, this is obviously something that is um, really ingrained in fashion. So, you know, someone has like a cool jewellery label in Sydney and they want to get it sold in like London and Japan and, you know, LA. And how do they do it? Like you're not, you can't go to every single city and go to every single store and just like knock on the door and be like, hey, can I talk to your buyer? Like 
And as much as like, yeah, you can email the stores and hope that they'll have a look at your, your catalog or your pieces. Realistically, like people get so many emails and so much spam and so much noise these days that it's hard to know if it even gets through in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so I would actually say that the most effective way to go about this is getting an agent. So there mm -hmm. are agencies who do specifically that. And it's like they have a really good network of distributors, so different stores in different categories, and they will take your product as part of, you know, a group of whatever products they're representing and say, have a look at, you know, these 20 brands, you know, we think that they'd suit your space. And so they're effectively, um, you know, showing your product on your behalf and trying to get it into different stores. So I think most of them work on like a fee and commission basis. So it's like, there's a, there's like a flat fee for engaging them, but then the, the they get a percentage of the sales that they make. So it's in their interest, you know, to be making those sales. So it's good for everyone. But yeah, I think that is the most, certainly the most time effective way, but I think it's something that even though it will cost a bit of money up front, it'll be so much more effective than just trying to knock on all those doors yourself because like they they know the stores they've got the relationships so i'd look into yeah distribution agents oh it's called distribution agents cool i didn't know that i didn't know there's a, such a thing called a distribution that's really cool um you said they normally either mm, they charge a flat fee up front and a percentage of like the wholesale deal they yeah they make. I think from the ones that I've had interaction with, I think that's how they work, but I'm sure different ones have different structures. Interesting. Um, and then a related topic on top of that is you worked with PR for many years. What is like a good, I know again, you can email the editor for your piece mm -hmm. or your article, but it doesn't, they get like millions of things every day. So what is a good way to go about getting a good piece of PR or like a writing article in like other publication? Um, yeah, how do I get like good PR? So I think first off, it's about having a good story. So PR, that's like, yes, it's interesting to be like, here's a new thing. But at the end of the day, you can only say that so many times, right? And like, if your brand's been in market for a while, they can't be like, here's a new thing because you know, you've, it's not that new. So you have to have some kind of hook, right? Which is why it's so great to do collaborations or limited mm. edition ranges or, you know, events or pop-ups or like things that give mm. a hook. So like mm. PR is always looking for that, like it's not, it's clickbaity, right? Like it's just yeah. like PR is like, is someone going to be like, oh, that sounds cool. Like it's just giving them a story to work with. Um, so I'd say, yeah, PR top tips are like, have, have a story, like create some kind of reason for them to want to write about you. Mm. Second tip would be basically not write the entire article, but write like a solid paragraph that gives them the information mm. they need to know. Because oh, you, want to make, you want to make it really easy for them. Right. Uh, so get your nice paragraph that has the explanation of what you're doing, some nice yeah. images, make sure that they're really easily accessible. So whether you put that in an email or in like a Dropbox and send them a link or whatever. Um, and my third tip for PR is don't email the editor because they mm. get so many emails, like ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> Look at the publications that you're trying to get into um, and find out who like the you know, a few levels down are. So like editors in particular, you know, you don't want to be emailing like the, the top editor in chief. You want to be going down to like even some of the senior journalists or, you know, like the, depending on what category it is, like the, the fashion features director or someone who is a few steps down from mm. the editor in chief because they're yeah. more likely to, actually see what you mail. 
yeah that's true well that's really helpful i love like make the point you're ma making that make their life easier everything needs to be super uh, accessible in your email and then have a simple like teaser paragraph with some images that's yeah that that's really helpful because I, I feel like oftentimes people will be just like oh i want to like get a piece on your article uh, I mean, I want to write a piece on, on your or an article on your um, publication and don't provide any additional things. Yeah. They're just like, delay, delay, yeah, delay. It's like too hard, like can't even yeah. think about it. But There's yeah. no time to follow up on this. I nope. love that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time okay. today. And I feel like I've uh, asked a lot of like selfish question and some questions related with your styling career, some question related about the course. Um, hopefully people who, are who will be watching this will find this uh, really helpful. And again, thank you so much for everything. Appreciate it. you. Thank you. Well, I hope you have a good rest of your day then. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Talk to you later. Bye.